गुरुर्ब्रह्मा गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वर गुरुरेव परम ब्रह्म अस्माय श्री गुरारे चिन्मयाप्यलोक्यम सचराचर तत्पद दर्शित अस्माय श्री गुरव नम माता पिता बंधु सखा वेद्या मम देव मेव सर्व मम देव देव ओम भद्रम कर्णे विष्णुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्यमक्ष भीर्यचक्रा स्थिराय रंगुष्टुवागुंसस्तनु व्यशेम देवितम यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्ध्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नो अरिष्ट मेमि स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्थ धातु ओ शांति 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 So where are we in our text? Oh, you are here. Okay. Chapter two, section one, number eight. You help us out, Punit. Chapter two, section one, mantra eight. Vidyate, vidya granthi, chinjante. शीयंते चास्य कर्माणि तस्मिन् दृष्टे परावरे When he is seen both in the higher and the lower, the knots of the seeker's heart become unite become untied. All doubts are dispelled and all his karmas are consumed. Yes. Yeah. So the khridaya grandi, the hearts, the knots of the heart. In Greek mythology, this was known as the Gordon's knot, and you would frequently see it in art, uh, frequently in mosaics on Roman floors and things like that. So, uh, energetically, of course, the Anahata chakra in the heart, where all the nadis emanate from, and when we're stuck. That's where all that energy gets congested, energetic. But the deeper meaning, the knots of the heart, have to do with our ignorance and the projections of the world that we take as real. So here, the mantra says, the person who knows both the higher knowledge. And the lower knowledge. So the paradigm we find in Yoga Vasishta addresses this, I think, the most clearly. We need to answer three questions. First question: Who am I? What is my essential nature? And our primary technique for that is drishya viveka, discrimination between the seer and the seen, literally. But it means discrimination between the subject and the object, the self and the not self. 
specifically, I am not the body, I am the knower of the body. I am not the prana, I am the knower of the prana. I am not the mind, I am the knower of the mind. I am not the buddhi, the intellect, I am the knower of the flow of thought. In the buddhi, I am not that karta, that sense of agency, this chid. Abhasa, this reflection of consciousness caught in the web of thought. And I'm not even pure ignorance, the darkness of deep sleep. Who am I? Witnessing consciousness. Pure existence. Pure awareness. Ananda, place to start with. Translated as no sorrow reaches there. Physical pain. Usually expressed in the scriptures as heat and cold. Get as far as my body. Sukham dukham cha. Pleasure and suffering get as far as my mind. Siddha asiddha. Success and failure, honor and dishonor, as far as my insight. Nothing touches. But we're not done when we finish this. Discrimination. So after we've discriminated between the self and the not self, the scriptures say, guess what? We lie to you. There's no not self. What we've been calling the not self is also the self. What is this world and how has it come about? So this is the lower knowledge. We have to see the self in and through all the phenomena. How do we do this? The practice that's implied is, first of all, turn down the volume level on our reactivity to the world. Let it go. Don't sweat the small stuff. It's all small stuff. Make peace of mind your most prized possession. Nothing in this world is important enough for us to lose our peace of mind. Or as Tejo Mayanandi <clears throat> used to say, do you know how to get rid of your worries? What, did, what was the answer? Tell my answer. Quit worrying, yes. My worrying causes me to see a worrisome world. Understand then the deeper practice. The scriptures invite us to meditate that this world comes about like a dream. If you clearly understand the dream state, then you'll understand how this world has come about. I like to say you are the God of your dream. You experience, I call it mini Maya at night. In the dream. First of all, there's the non-apprehension of yourself as the waker. We call that deep sleep. Then the subsequent misapprehension, the mind projects a phenomenal world in the dream state, which consists of a dream body with which we identify. 
and then we look out and see the dream world. And inside we have dream thoughts and feelings reacting to that dream world. But the whole thing, knower, knowing, and known in the dream state is my one non-dual mind. So also, sarvam idam swapmeveti. All this world is, as it were, like a dream. Who's doing the dreaming? Well, we have two levels of projection. The third question we get from Yoga Vasishta, how has this world come about? And the answer is sankalpena, by means of imagination. So the first dreamer is God, Ishwar, Vajapati, Brahma. It's many names. Other scriptures will call it Hiranyagarbha. So it comes about by an act of willing, wishing, intending, imagining by the infinite. And that world is inherently neutral. A supernova isn't mean or nice, it just is. The law of gravity isn't just or unjust, it just is. And this God, this Ishwara, creates everything, including your body, mind, intellect, all the way down to the smallest atom, subatomic quarks string. Then there's a second layer of Sankalpa. The human mind is such that I project onto Ishwara's world. This is beautiful. That's ugly. This is desirable. That's horrible. This is just, that's unjust. This brings me pleasure. This brings me misery. That's my zoo. And to some degree, I like to say God doesn't create the world add us and to us, but as us and through us. We participate in the creative process. How does the infinite create the world? So you guys drive a fancy car. What kind of car is it again? I got an Audi. It's an Audi. Okay. Well, how did God create the Audi? <clears throat> First of all, somebody had to want Audis. And the Audi company had to make one. So God created the Audi as us and through us, not at us and to us. Not quite the same as when you go see a tree. So we participate in it. Listen carefully. Most of the ills and the suffering that we experience in the world is of our own making. So, these three questions. Who am I? What is this world? How has it come about? The lower knowledge, 
all this world, sarvam kalpitam dhamma, all this world is verily dhamma. How have the names and forms come about? By means of imagination, this double layer of projection. But what's really here, this is the supreme knowledge. Brahma. Brahma satyam jaganidya. Brahman alone is real. The phenomenal world, Nitya, illusory. Pretty, but it's ephemeral. And the person who meditates on this, and again, it's not just trying to talk ourselves into it. The more we thin out the mind, the mature vairagya. The rishis who wrote the Upanishad were describing their direct experience. They are not superhuman. They have the same equipment as you and me. It's available to us. We choose to go through the process. Any thoughts? Any questions? Um, yes, sir. What page in the book are we on? Um, I don't think that was the right mantra, actually. Okay. <laughs> I'm on mantra eight on chapter two, uh, page hundred. Se section oh, one. Oh, section one. I see. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> well, it was it was a good mantra anyway. <laughs> That's why I didn't interrupt. interrupt. <laughs> yes, please. So the lower knowledge, as you said, is to see the self through everything in the world. Yes. But if everything in the world is uh, mitya, so how does that, how does this do reconcile? Well, you reconcile it first of all by seeing that the names and forms are seen. But the knowledge is to see them for what they are. Unreal, but behind. For example, you look up and you see what the ancients would call the bowl of the sky. There's this enormous bowl painted blue. If that be true, you better not get on an airplane. You're going to crash into the, the, the roof. You know, there were <clears throat> little pinholes in it, and that's where the starlight came from. That's not what's really there. If you go to Ocean Beach in San Francisco and sit on the beach, you can watch the container ships come from out the Golden Gate, sailing west towards Asia, and then they fall off the edge of the world. You watch them literally go down, you know, hull down, and then the superstructure, and then finally they're gone. Are the ships falling off the edge of the world? What's causing it? It's the curvature of the earth. It's creating the optical illusion. Seen but not real. One of my favorites. If you uh, change trains on the BART at the West Oakland BART station, you look down the tracks and the train tracks meet in the distance. Better not get on the train. 
when it reaches that point where the tracks meet, you're going to crash. Do the tracks meet in the distance or is that a vanishing point, an optical illusion? Seen, but not real. Mm -hmm. So are you catching the idea? Yeah. The most famous one in scripture, you probably have heard this a thousand times, mirage waters in the desert. When you're moving through the desert in ignorance, your senses report water and your knowledge is water. You keep driving and the water recedes. And then you realize, oh, it's heat waves off the sand. It's an optical illusion. But it still looks like water. But your knowledge is sand. So you get a disappointing review of work. You talk about that. It's just like a bad dream. Doesn't touch you. Of course, if you get a good review at work, that's just the pleasant dream. <laughs> now, what's true about both of them? First truth, anitya, impermanent. Second truth, never touches it's like going to the movies oh so seeing the self through it all is seeing your own self not only well there is no other self yeah. and to understand that all the names and forms are just a light show. It's a virtual reality. I love when you were telling me, was it in New York, where they had the, the display of the mirrors? Yeah. Refresh our memory. What, what, what was the, the thing? Well, it was a show, uh, an art exhibit, where you walk into one of the rooms and there's mirrors on all sides. So, and there was uh, a visualization or some video that was playing from one side that was being reflected on all the mirrors. So when you look down, it just feels like you're gonna fall into an abyss because it just keeps going. And so for a moment there was, I felt a little bit of fear just stepping onto it. Even though I knew it was just mirrors, I just felt like I might just fall. How powerful is sensory data? So powerful. This is the Lord's Maya. This is the Lord's Maya. Seen but not real. Now, in actuality, as you continue to meditate, thin the mind. The phenomenal world itself starts to get thinner and thinner. So in very deep meditative states with your eyes wide open, closest I can come to talk about it is the phenomena feels like a transparency. It's almost like you could stick your hand right through it. So unsubstantial. What's here? Consciousness. Not out there, but it is out there. It's not only inside. It's not just behind, but it's in front, it's above, it's below, it's everywhere. Vijnanam, as Mandukya says, a homogeneous mass of consciousness. Is that useful? Yes, thank you. Very good question. All right, so uh, Prajapati, 
decided to have us do a different mantra for the first part this morning. So let's see what the actual mantra is we're supposed to study. Sapta prana prabhavanti tasmat saptat saptar chishaha samidha sapta omaha sapta ime loka yeshu charanti prana uha shaya nihita sapta sapta from him are born seven pranas the seven flames sevenfold fuel the sevenfold oblations as also the seven worlds where the pranas move in the cave of living creatures, seven and seven. Yes. So this is mystic symbolism. Would you read Swamiji's commentary? I must confess, I've forgotten the symbolism of all these sevens. On a rough reading, this would naturally confuse anyone, for in its literal meaning, it has no sense at all. But it is the style of the scriptures to use such code language. The Shruti mantras are, as it were, very brief lecture notes taken down by the most intelligent students while listening to the discourse of the Rishis. If anyone were to read the class notes of a college student, he is sure to get himself confused unless he himself has attended the lectures. Similarly, this mantra looks as though it is a short formula only to bring the memory at all that the student heard in the lecture theater. From the Supreme Self are born the seven sense holes in the head, two eyes, two nostrils, two ears, and one mouth. The seven flames mentioned are the seven powers of cognition that we mouth, as it were, to illumine their respective objects. Thus, through the eyes, intelligent beams out to perceive form and color. Through the ears, vitality shoots out to illumine sound. Each sense organ can illumine only its objects. With the ears, we cannot recognize form, nor can we see sounds with our eyes. A flame can be maintained only when there is fuel for it. Here, the fuel for these cognition rays are nothing but their objects themselves. If there were no sound at all, naturally, we would not have recognized that we have an organ called ears that can perceive sound. In this sense, sound is the fuel that maintains the flame of sound consciousness shooting through the ears. The oblations referred to here must naturally mean the knowledge gained when the power of cognition shooting out through the senses come in contact with their respective objects. Oblation is that which is thrown into the flames and which sinks down into the very source of the flame, there to get itself digested and burnt down. The seven lokas in this beautiful metaphor maintaining the general spirit of the poetry in the stanza, we must take the word loka here to mean the sense centers in the intellect. It is known to the scientific world that there are definite nerve centers or the inner principles of the senses without which the external sense organs cannot by themselves function nor control the sense organs. The vitality of these centers retires and takes rest, as it were, in the cave of the heart where intelligence remains, where the individual is in a state of deep sleep. That word prana here cannot be the vital air is clearly shown by this suggestive description that they move and function in the cave of the heart. The pictorial language, though it adds beauty and extra joy to the glory of the scriptures, is to us a stumbling block in understanding the correct meaning because we are not used to it in these days of commercial literature and cable gram poetry. <laughs> That's the so again, the style of the Upanishad, it is deliberately coded it is maximum meaning with minimum words and is unavailable to the uninitiated, which is why for Upanishad, it can only be studied with a teacher or a very good commentary to get grasp its meaning. And even when you studied it before, you forget what the symbols are. Going on. Ata Samudra Nira Yascha Sarve Smart Siddhante Sindhava Sarva Rupaha Atascha Sarva Oshadhayo Rasashwa Rasascha Yenaisha Bhutais Teshtate Yantaratma. From him, all the oceans and mountains. From him, the rivers of every description, 
from him all herbs and saps too by which the subtle body exists, indeed encircled by the gross elements of matter. Yes, so here he's riffing on this in-depth description of the lower Brahman, meaning all the phenomena of the jagat, the manifest world, is nothing but consciousness appearing as name and form. The scriptures and other places will give us metaphors like what is the material cause of all clay pots, be it a vase, be it a bowl, be it a cup, be it a plate. It's all just clay. Clay is the material cause. The names, cup, bowl, plate, vase are our descriptions of the form the clay takes. Gold ornaments, whether it's an earring, whether it's a necklace, whether it's a nose ring, whether it's a bracelet, the material cause is gold. The shapes and the use are nama rupa, name. And form. So what this mantra is saying, just like the one we're going to get later in the next chapter, the material cause of all the phenomena is consciousness. Listen carefully. In reality, Consciousness never leaves its nature, its swarup, which is Satchidana. It's my misinterpretation of things that makes me think that it is joy giving, misery goes. That famous statement Brahma Satyam Jagan Nitya can be interpreted Brahma Satyam Brahman unconditioned reality that's what's true Jagan Mitya the phenomenal world is a conditioned reality same stuff still Brahma but what's happening is it appears to my senses as name and form. And just like whether it's cup, bowl, vase, or plate, when the forms are destroyed, the material cause, the clay, is still there. I don't know if they still do this, but in some of my earlier visits to India, you'd go by a tea stall, we used to call them, and you'd get a sun-fired uh, cup in which they put the tea. Do, yeah. you, do they still do that? They do. And so after you've had your tea from the roadside tea stall, what do you do with the cup? Toss it. And what happens to it? They remove it. Mm -hmm. They remake it. It goes down to the mud. Yeah. And then the next day or a week later, tea, uh, walla, whatever they call him, puts the mud together, water, makes his little cups, sets them out, and they become sun fired. So all the names and forms. Come out of non existence, they exist for a while, and entropy sets in, and then they go back to non existence. But what they're made of, 
Hamlet. Never really got a big success. Next verse. Purusha Devedam Visham Karma Tapo Brahma Paratritam Etadhyo Veda Nantnihitam Guhayam So Vidya Granthim Vikiratiha Somya Iti Mundokam Upanishad Vitiya Mundako Prathamakhandaha The Purusha alone is all this universe. The sacrificial works, karma and knowledge, tapas. All this is Brahman, the highest and the immortal. O oh, good-looking you, he who knows this as seated in the cavity of the heart, he unties the knot of ignorance even here. Yeah. So, good-looking you, that includes David and Diaz. <laughs> the person who understands this higher Brahman and lower Brahman. Saguna Brahman, Brahman with qualities, the phenomenal world. Near Guna Brahman, Brahman without qualities, the self. Always experienced as I. That's what unties the knots of my life. That's what frees me from existential suffering. You get a bad review at work, don't worry. Nothing touches you. Your Parkinson's progresses. Don't worry. Nothing touches you. Mother, your wife passes from visual sight. Don't worry. Nobody dies. We're safe. Always. Second thing. Where do I find peace of mind? Where do I find happiness? The cause of my agitation is attachment and identification. I think the world needs to be a certain way. I think I need to be a particular kind of person. I can let go of that. You can do as you will in the world. Did that in this section? I think yeah. it did. Yeah. Yes, it did. All right. So now we start the second section of the second chapter, correct? Yeah. Chapter two, section two. Avi. Sannihitam Guhacharam Nama Mahat Padam Aitrat Samarpitam Ajat Prana Nimishcha Yade Tajja Naka Sadasad Viranyam Param Vignana Dhya Varishtam Prajanam Bright, existing very close, known as moving in the cavity of the heart great and the support of all. In him is all the universe centered round. What moves, breathes, and wings? Know it, which is both with form and without form, the most adorable, the highest of beings, the one beyond the understanding of creatures. So again, this is mystic symbolism, not literalism. 
So we have this idea of right. There is a school of Buddhist thought called the Shunya Vadas, usually translated as the scoliasts of the void, who posit that there is no ultimate reality, that consciousness itself is an imagination. This is not the teaching of Vedanta. You are conscious being. And here the scripture uses the word Purusha. translated depending on its context and historical perspective in many ways. Literally just means person. But in Bhagavad Gita, we get the term Purushottama, Uttama, Purusha. The modern ISKCON people will translate that as the supreme personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna. Worship the supreme personality of Godhead. Not too different than the Christians. There's God the Father, but then God the Son, Jesus. He's the supreme personality of God. God the Son came into a form. But I would say it has a deeper meaning because ultimate reality is not shunya, void. It's purna, full. What's it full of? It's full of bhava. It's full of being. It's full of prakash, light. Not a light that you see. You are the light that illuminates everything. What is it that makes you you? What is the ultimate essence of personness? So, if you had your legs amputated, would you still be you? Or Dave, my, do you mind me talking about the medical stuff you and sure. I have talked about? Sure. Yeah. So David and I have been talking about, you know, we're both getting old. But um, Parkinson's. So if Parkinson's progresses and you find you have virtually no movement anymore, are you still you? Yes, of course. What is it that makes you, you? It's not the body. You are the knower of the body. It's not your feelings, not your thoughts. But you're not an it. You are a being, you are the being. And you exist. Being, sat, being, existence. And you shine as knowing itself. Gita says, who is the knower of the field in all fields? Chaitanya. Whenever anything is known, who is known? You? No. 
I do the ego. But you who are consciousness itself. So this is the deep meaning of right. What's the next thought? Existing very close. So it's interesting when you go to somebody and say, tell me about yourself. And say, well, this is my name. This is where I grew up. This is my culture. Or in the U.S., this is my job. This is my bank account. This is where I live. Or if you have gone to the psychotherapist, who are you? Oh, I'm a person who has this issue. I have PTSD. I'm a survivor of this, that, and the other thing. I have this disorder. You are none of these things. Closer than hand or foot. Closer than your breath. Closer than your inner mood. Talking with someone this week. I learned something, at least for him. Hanging out is a euphemism for having sex. Is that how all the young people use it? Oh, mm -hmm. Maybe. I don't know. I never... But I just thought that was very funny. So he's hanging out with his girlfriend. Come to find out that means they do the mufti pufti. And then he confesses, well, they like to get into role-playing games. He starts to tell me about, uh, he's a dom, he's a dominant, she's a sub, a submissive. They're fun. Oh, he had such a hard time telling me about this. He could not share who he thought he was. That's not real. It's something he does, it's something that his mind feels, his intellect thinks. Who are we? What is the ultimate? essence of you as a person. Closer than hand or foot, closer than your breath, closer than your deepest secrets, your innermost thoughts. It's your very experience of I. You will never see yourself as an object. Oh, Jim, I was in meditation and I saw the self. It went by. Gold white light. I saw it. No, nope, that's not yourself. Who saw the gold white light? That's yourself. So investigate this purusha, the ultimate essence of what it is to be a person. You're not an it, you're not a thing, you're not void, you're not non-existent. You are no thing, but you're not nothing. You shine, you are bright. 
you have bhava, you have being. You are the eternal subject, never an object. Next idea. Known as moving in the cavity of the heart. Yes. So, we illumine the energy flows. We talked about this as we were discoursing on the prior mantra. In the Anahata Chakra, all the Nadis meet there. Thousands of them. So the energy moves out from that in all sorts of ways. David and I were talking about acupuncture. So when the acupoker puts the little needles in various energy centers to free up the flow of the energy, I don't know what they call them in Chinese medicine, but in Sanskrit, it's nadis. It's the energy flows. Many ancient cultures have understood these things. But that's not what we're really talking about here. That's the exoteric understanding. Esoteric understanding. What do the scriptures mean? We talk about the Pradaya Guha. Guha. Pradaya Guha or Gufa. The cave of the heart. So, if you're out hiking and you come across a bear cave, Cave is context, bear is content. If you find a bat cave, cave is context, the bats are content. If you're in the mountains in France, you see these Neanderthal caves. Cave is context. The Neanderthals were content. So, what's the cave of the heart? What is the place where your thoughts go by and your feelings? What is the frame for context for your subtlest perception? And when the intellect becomes completely quiet and manas, the mind ceases all its struggling, everything is. We see the context is pure awareness. This is the deeper meaning of the cave of the heart. Next idea. The great and uh, great and the support of all. So these four Mahavakyas that we find in the Upanishads. The first one, Rajnanam Brahma. Brahma is consciousness. Where is it found? I am Atma Brahma. This self is Brahma. So when you discover your own self. So myself is witnessing consciousness. David, what's your self? We're witnessing consciousness too. Does this mean there's little clumps of witnessing consciousness? That's what the Sankhyas would say. 
little pieces of purushas running around. But the Vedanta says, no. And the best way I've been able to explain it, this again is just a worldly example. If I were to take a large piece of butcher paper and put six holes in it and darken the room and there was light behind the holes, you would see six lighted pinholes. Now the question is, is there a small pen light behind each one of the holes? Or is there one flashlight, one torch? What you see on the other side is the same light coming through these pinholes. Now, let's pretend this pinhole is conscious because of the light of consciousness goes into meditation and practices self-inquiry. Ooh, the flashlight, that's the source of my being. And it talks to the pinhole over here. And it, ooh, I did self-inquiry too. I'm a flashlight. Are there two flashlights? One light. So also, <laughs> the self in me is not like the self in you. The self in me is the self in you. It's very careful. Your experience of I is not a part of Brahman. It's the totality of Little old me, Brahma's not very big. Well, how big are you? Sometimes I feel like I'm a point from which perception peeps out. But sometimes when I get really quiet, it's like what's behind my eyes, like that. Well, the truth is, you are outside of dimension. Space and time are in you. You are not in space. Now, when consciousness is peeping through the equipment, it appears to the intellect that sense of I is limited and individual. It's not. Don't believe me. Don't believe the scripture. Take it as a hypothesis. If we are scientific, when we're studying scientists, we're given hypotheses, and then it's our job to prove or disprove them in a laboratory. A yogi is a spiritual scientist. We take these ideas we get in scripture we take them as hypotheses. Now, prove or disprove them. Laboratory of your own direct experience. Keep thinning the mind. 
see what's revealed. What the Upanishad says here is, I, not I the individual, it's the source, the summit, all that is manifest. That doesn't mean I, Jim, am working magic. What appears is Jim or somebody or DS is an idea. It's a construct. It's not really I. It's like a dream self. All this has its source in I. And it goes nowhere. It came from nowhere. It never changes. It cannot die. And listen carefully. You are a conscious being. <laughs> All right, next one, next idea. In him is all the universe centered around. Yes. Same idea we've been working on. Next, is that the end of it? Uh, what moves, breeds, and winks. Yes. So all the things in being have as their substratum Brahman, Brahman and all. including the people we hate or who annoy us. They too are perfect. Doesn't mean they are right or wrong, good or bad from a worldly perspective, but they're fulfilling their goal of creation. How do I know that? Because they're there. Nobody else did it. What do we know about them? Thank God they're temporary. Soul is this thing, and your body is not. All right. Is that all of the pieces? A uh, few more ideas. Okay. Know it which is both without form and with form. Yes. So again, this idea of Saguna Brahman, Brahman with uh, qualities and Nirguna Brahman, Brahman without qualities. We need to know oh, why. You can meditate and meditate and meditate do pranayama and asana. Maybe have some euphoric moments by hyperventilating or stopping the, the flow of thought for a while. But as long as I continue to think the phenomenal world is concrete, solid, real, inherently joy giving or misery producing. And when I come out of meditation, I'm still caught up in the illusion of sunshine. So I must address those three questions. Who am I? What is this world? How is it? Is that all the pieces now? A uh, couple more. Okay. The most adorable. Oh, yes. So one of the things self-realization gives us is I finally find out where happiness is. So I call this the ruthless rule of the mind. The mind will continue to return to the experience that's given it the greatest joy. 
from the moment you get up in the morning to the moment your head hits the pillow, the only thing the mind is engaged in, what a human mind is, is seeking the good and avoiding suffering. Everything you do is to gain the good and avoid suffering. But what about altruistic people? What about people who sacrifice their own well-being for the good of others? Why are they doing it? Because it's their highest idea of the good. Always comes down to that. What the yogi understands, what does it feel like to want something you don't want. And it's three forms. Raja, uh, Raga, Vesha, Aya. Raga, my passion for this. Vesha, aversion. I want to get rid of that. Aya, fear. I may have what I want, but I'm afraid I'm going to lose it. Can you find any other kind of suffering? Now, we can put physical pain on the shelf. That's not what normally tortures people. Yoga says there's no other suffering. What happens when I get what I want? Desire, not just a desire to become one. Actually, for a moment, the craving, the kama, the longing, the sriha, abates. And the more I wanted it, and the more completely I got it, the more satisfying that is. Yoga says that's a taste of my own self-nature. The mind has ceased its craving. It's come home. It's like the waves of the ocean. Come back to the ocean. And the storm is over. In Gita, Krishna says, everyone in every way only seeks me just by the wrong method. Oh, I really want a better job. What are you going to get when you get the better job? I'll be happy. Oh, I really want a different house. How are you going to feel when you get the house? Happy. I really want children. Oh, I want a baby. How are you going to feel when you get the baby? Happy. I was talking with a woman last night. She's got three kids. The oldest is a heroin addict. How are you going to feel when you have that baby? It's, it's a heroin addict. Very sad. All that we understand then about again is the only source of real happiness is the mind coming home to the self. The world is bad. The world is disgusting or evil. It's actually quite neutral. Happiness is the mind abiding in the self. The self is the most adorable. In fact, it's the only thing to be loved and adored. Oh, I really love fill in the blank. In my ignorance, I think that's where the joy, the love, the happiness, the bliss is. I 
only use that to momentarily induce the condition of the mind free from its reshape, the shakti, its extroversion. That's all that happens. Don't believe me. Watch your suffering, my friends will live. And own your ananda. Watch what happens when you get what you want. Happiness tastes the same. We get confused because of the diversity of sensory experience. What it does to my mind is the same. It's really just the self. All right, one more piece. We'll go a little over today. The highest of beings. Yes. I think we've pretty much addressed that. And the last one is the one beyond the understanding of creatures. Yes. So how is the self both unknowable and knowable? It is a jintyam. You can't figure it out. Of your padesha. You can't really in the end talk about it. The senses do not go there. Yet it is always known. When are you ever not you? It's yourself. Who ever had a moment where you have ceased to be? Beyond which there is nothing. All right, so what mantra are we on for next week? Uh, chapter two, number three, or number two? Number two. Chapter, chapter two, two, section two, number two. Two, two, two. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadhaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Pyonamaha Hari Om 